This is episode 10 of the Women in Depth podcast. Hey everyone, today my guest is Tamara Powell. Tamara is a psychotherapist and coach in Pensacola, Florida, whose focus is on supporting individuals struggling with issues related to sexuality and spirituality. This encompasses gender, sexual, erotic, and relational diversity, including polyamory and kink, as well as spiritual abuse and trauma. In today's conversation, Tamara will deepen our understanding of what spiritual abuse is and its effects on the individual. I'm excited about this episode because I feel that spirituality plays such a huge part in the lives of many, many individuals, and so spiritual abuse has the potential to impact many, many people in a significant way. I know in my practice and in my own life, there are many people who have experienced spiritual abuse and the psychological and emotional injuries are deep and not easy to heal from. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, and welcome to the podcast. Today, our guest is Tamara Powell. Tamara is a licensed mental health counselor and empowerment coach specializing in identity work, particularly issues related to sexuality and spirituality. In 2014, she opened ARIA Therapy Services in Pensacola, Florida, with a mission of bringing holistic and diversity-affirming therapeutic services to the Bible Belt. Since then, she has expanded ARIA into a group practice and personally works with clients all over the world online. Most recently, Tamara created a tribe she calls Tales from a Trapezoid, dedicated to the more raw, intimate, and edgy side of being a trapezoid in a world full of circles. Hi, Tamara, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lourdes. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I just have been intrigued by your work and the, the individuals that you're able to support. And so just thank you for being here. I've been looking forward to it as well. Just to start off, would you share more about yourself with our listeners? Sure. That always feels like a dating ad. <laughs> I never know where to start, right? <laughs> So, like the bio said, I started ARIA in 2014. After having taken a big pause, I suppose, to get married and have children and really figure out if psychology was going to be my main source for making money and my big passion. And when my daughters returned to school, it was a good time to finish the master's and, and go into private practice. So now I kind of divide my time. I call myself a mom mom entrepreneur. That's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. um, hard to do so too. <laughs> it is very hard to do. Yes. Lots of running around here and there and seeing clients, but I wouldn't change it for the world. So my big puzzle that I love diving into with clients is what you mentioned, the sexuality and spirituality and often where they intersect and where I'm located down here in Pensacola, there's a big need for that. As I work with a more progressive and out of the box client group, including LGBT, poly polyamory, kink, that type of thing, and then how that intersects with their spiritual worldview. Tamara, I found it really interesting, you know, about this intersection of spirituality and sexuality that you, you speak about. And can you tell me a little bit more about maybe why you were drawn into that work or attracted to that area? Absolutely. So I grew up as the daughter of a career army soldier. So we moved around not as often as other military families, but still quite a bit. So we lived in several different areas in the United States and also overseas in Japan, which allowed me the opportunity to really see different cultures interact in every facet of life, which would obviously include spirituality and you know, what psychology calls mating behaviors, for sure. On top of that, layered in, my family still very much is part of a fundamentalist Christian denomination. And so what was normal to me, I noticed was not always normal to my playmates. And yet, as a really cool paradox, is my family has 
fundamentalist as they are, were very open about letting my siblings and I have friends of different spiritual worldview. So if we spent the night at a friend's house who was Catholic, we would attend mass with them. No biggie. For some, they were Jehovah's Witness, so we might attend their church as well. And I remember even as a very young kid being fascinated by what worked for each family and what the similarities were and what the differences were. And then as I grew up and, you know, became a teenager and a lot of our friends started having sex, realizing that each religious system treated that very differently and some of my friends seemed to navigate that with no problems while others had a really hard time with the institutionalized shame and the internalized shame and regret and then as I moved into an older woman and having children and getting married and originally starting to do groups in the church I heard story after story of women being my thing, having sexual dysfunction. And it just piqued my interest as to, well, why does it work so well for some and not for others? Where is that going wrong? And so that's what started my first inquiry. And in graduate school, I just took every opportunity I could. Anytime a professor gave me a project, I would use it as a way to study the subject. Thank you for sharing that background. You know, it's interesting because you can just see how with the different perspectives and approaches to spirituality, whether it's organized religion or not organized religion, or some more in between, definitely, I guess, beliefs, feelings, approaches regarding mm. sexual practices would play a part and could really, I guess, create some distress for some people. Right. And then absolute sources of strength and support for others. For example, my LGBT clients who happen to have a spiritual practice that isn't, you know, incongruent with how they view their sexual identity, it's one of their strongest support factors. Yeah. And I think, you know, like just what you're speaking about with, you know, spirituality being potentially a huge support for an individual. Mm -hmm. And this really segues into, you know, what we will be talking about today. Without that support or that support, feeling challenged or not as as strong or, or any questioning or shame around that really takes away, I would guess, it really takes away a source of support and strength for the individual. Absolutely. And we see that in the psychological research all the time. And what I have found incredibly interesting is how few graduate programs and even continuing education programs are preparing clinicians to be able to handle topics regarding spirituality. So many of my colleagues, and including myself at times, if I'm honest, we get so uncomfortable with having someone ask about spirituality. It's almost as if we want to just have this blank slate idea where, you know, oh, that's too personal, which is weird because I'm asking them to talk to me about their (laughs) sex life. (laughs) Right. (laughs) No, but it's like, oh, religion and politics, we're not going to go there. And what I have seen time after time in my own practice is really consistent with the literature that at least one in three, if not way higher, wants their therapist to at least inquire about their spiritual worldview. You know, I was just speaking with um, a few other guests on the podcast and, you know, one of them, uh, Sharani Pathak, asking about spirituality is just part of her normal process with starting therapy with a new client. And Jody Gale, who uh, is out in Australia and focuses on eating disorders, just we discussed how not having that spiritual support or that spiritual context to frame their experiences in really makes moving forward in a meaningful way more difficult for the client. I would absolutely agree. That's awesome to hear that there are other clinicians looking at it that way. It's part of our intake paperwork. And for those that it's not something that they think about, no big deal. We just move on. And even then, however, we still attempt to find ways of incorporating it. I might use language like their levels of being or different ways of self-care, but it doesn't have to be an organized religion. Tamara, could you share a little bit more about maybe what's some of those questions are just to give our listeners an idea of what that might sound like. Sure. So on our paperwork, before they even walk in the door, I will ask them if they happen to have a particular spiritual affiliation or spiritual worldview. And then if so, is it meaningful or important to them? And that kind of gives me a baseline to go into the session with. So for example, one might say, I'm Baptist and this is incredibly important to me. We go to church every single week. Then I'm naturally going to tweak my questions regarding their sexuality 
to be more congruent with their worldview or at least attempting to show deference or respect to that. If it's something I'm more unfamiliar with, for example, I've had clients who have had particular affiliations with certain forms of voodoo or santeria and that I don't know quite as much about, although I do do my best to stay as competent as possible. (laughs) I might just ask them a little bit more about that. Like, well, I do happen to know that, you know, most people who are in Santeria believe in Orishas. Can you tell me, is there a particular one for your household? And what does that mean to you? And when you think of spirituality, how do you look at that? And then because I'm really big into the depth side and also archetypes and schemas, I might ask them what they were brought up in and what others' expectations for them and their spiritual practice was supposed to be as well. And then where they see themselves moving forward, what gives them a sense of purpose and meaning? Are there rituals that they like to engage in? And then if religious language is not something they're very comfortable with, I might just move it over towards the mindfulness piece of it or meditation. Ask them where they feel most connected to something outside themselves. I think by far and large, most of humanity is pretty okay with that type of language. You know, as I was listening to you describe that this process of really being curious about the spiritual beliefs or practices that a client comes in with, you really began to answer my, my next question, which was, how do you support all the different ways that a person can connect to something larger than themselves? But I could hear just in the questions of that curiosity and being respectful. And, you know, while you're staying up on your own learning, having the client teach you about their experience. Absolutely, because what I have learned from actual personal experience traveling the world and attending even this different church locations that ascribe to the same denomination, what one pastor teaches is not going to be the same as another pastor, just because they both call themselves Pentecostal. One may believe in speaking in tongues, and the other one may look more like the Mennonites, where the women don't cut their hair or wear pants. And so I think it's very important, even if they say Baptist, to ask them, well, particularly, what does that mean for you? And how does that provide you a sense of self-care even. Tamara, I love hearing how you describe this. I can imagine that your clients feel very supported and really appreciate your effort to see them and that they can be seen and there's no judgment. There's a lot of acceptance and compassion. And you're just inspiring me also in how I would like to maybe make some shifts in, in that process for me. So thank you so much for that. Oh, thank you. I think it really speaks to the heart of being phenomenological, right? I want to see the world as they see it before we attempt to talk about what's giving them some distress. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense and would be the the loving, respectful way to go about it. (laughs) And and I also thought of a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I'm not going to say as eloquently, but it goes something like this, that God enters into every individual's life through a private door, which I feel really captures that personal, individual, unique experience that every person has of something larger than themselves. I freaking love that. I recently heard about a group of people, I think it was in Russia, that their version of spirituality meant cutting a hole into the wall for the light to come in. They didn't have a particular shrine or idol or iconography for their religion, but it was the space where, you know, the divine came in. And that quote just really reminds me of that. Yeah. Wow. I could just see an image of light shining in your window. That's beautiful. So today, you know, what I had wanted to talk with you about more is the experience of spiritual abuse. And so maybe before jumping into that, could you speak a little bit more about what is the difference between spiritual and religious? So I suppose as with anything, it depends upon who you are talking to. When I use the term spiritual, I use it as a broader, more umbrella term to mean that which is beyond just physical, then emotional, cognitive, and then I think spiritual, the peace of us that we experience in connection to something outside of ourselves. I have clients who get out in nature and they experience a sense of spiritual connection or oneness, as opposed to religion, which might mean a codified, more dogmatic, more 
institutionalized, organized form of practicing their spirituality. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm glad you also prefaced that with even with these attempts at defining Mm -hmm. these words, it's still Mm -hmm. so personal. So can we just start with maybe you explaining what spiritual abuse is? Spiritual abuse, from my opinion, is one of the most insidious forms because it doesn't always leave marks. Similarly to emotional abuse or verbal abuse, it's not something that we always see on our clients when they first walk in and they don't even know how to define it. And I think that that's an important starting point is that it's something that really attacks their worldview. It's something that takes that component, which to me, I look at spirituality as kind of bleeding into all of those other parts of self that I was just referring to, like your cognitive side, your thinking style and your emotions and what you are going to do. My spirituality would inform all of that. And so spiritual abuse can sometimes take the place of a pastor or priest or any religious leader abusing their authority to either create rules that are not inherent in that religious system's sacred texts. So certainly the megalomaniacs are included in that. It's also more frequently seen here in the United States and white Christian middle America and having women feel as though they need to stay in domestic abuse situations longer than they ever should. I personally don't think they should ever stay if they're being beaten, whether they choose to remain married or not is beside the point. It can also be a form of causing a woman to take in, internalize, thank you, the idea of misogyny or patriarchy or that her worth is only valued in her virginity or in her submission to a man and her husband and before her husband to her father. It can also take the sense of self regarding that sexual component and twist it on the psyche. So if a child starts getting the inkling that he or she is gay or lesbian or transgender or even has gender expressions or gender roles that are non-conforming to that particular religious practice, that is considered abuse if it causes that child's psyche to now turn in on itself. You can see how even as I'm trying to explain it, it's almost very difficult to define and pinpoint. Yeah. And basically anything that cracks the worldview. Okay. And cracks the individual's worldview, taking that away, shattering it and imposing Mm -hmm. another worldview upon them in some way. Right. Taking away their autonomy, just like verbal abuse would or emotional abuse would. It's taking away the respect for the humanity and the inherent worth of the individual, imposing another's belief system upon it. And you've described a little bit of this, but could you maybe explain how spiritual abuse impacts an individual in the long term. So let's say that they experience this in their childhood or their adolescence, and then not even aware that that's what they experienced. How does that show up later or how can it show up? It can show up in an overly rigid belief system and in one that is incredibly pejorative against the self. So I have met undergraduates who might struggle with their grades, for example, when I worked at a counseling center at the University of West Florida. And for those who were in rigid fundamentalist systems, they'd automatically beat themselves up way harder than any of the others would because they felt like they were failing not only themselves, but also their families and God because they should quote unquote, be doing better. And perhaps they had unresolved sin in their lives. Perhaps they hadn't been praying hard enough. I've also seen women who did not quite understand that, you know, sexual feelings here and there were a normal part of developmental experience and not because they had a lust problem. So a lot of shame. A lot of shame. And a lot of self-judgment, it's sounding like. Mm-hmm. Because rather than exploring what is authentic to me, what is developmentally normal, I'm reading it through the eyes of never being good enough. Wow. Mm. And I could imagine that for individuals who are experiencing this, there's a real struggle to really, I guess, get back to themselves and what their worldview really as a reflection of who they are, 
when oftentimes these religious beliefs that are being imposed upon them or which have cracked their worldview are coming from loved ones, like family. Absolutely. And so coming out or even starting to question one's spiritual worldviews is one of the most scary things that I've seen anyone walk through because it's the bubble It provided a quick answer for everything. What is life after death? How do I even get to heaven? How do I relate to my fellow man? Is it okay to take out a loan? When do I have sex? Who do I get to have sex with? Literally, they're taught from a very young age that there's an answer for everything if they just look hard enough. You know, the way that you phrase that right now just really just captures how profoundly a person's identity can be taken from them because since all the answers are provided through a belief system, Mm -hmm. then they're not supposed to have answers of their own and there's no need to explore other answers. Exactly. And that's where you start to see even religious leaders start to, it's almost like they inoculate their believers as they're coming up in years and in their denominations where they'll say, you know, that whole cognitive dissonance idea that psychologists have, you won't have that problem if you will just listen to God and listen to me and not question. If you start questioning it, then that's where all the problems come in. That is considered abusive. And I love that you highlighted the point of identity because for me personally, that is the root of all of this struggle. You've literally cracked my psyche when you take that away from me. Yeah. And then also with, like you said, if you start questioning, not only does that contribute to the person's supposed struggle and distress as uh, explained by those who are, I guess, in these positions of power, Mm -hmm. but it also judges them and punishes them for even questioning. Right. And the beauty of it, I suppose, the twisted beauty of it is that the person in power doesn't even have to be around them for that to continue on afterwards. It's kind of like a sunburn that continues baking in for hours later. That child could be at home attempting to fall asleep and their own inner critic is now joining in. So it allows for complete rigid control even when they're not around the abuser. Yeah, you make me think of a study that I can't remember the study, but I, I was a few years ago. And in the study, they had researched families who raised their children in a more organized, structured, institutionalized type spiritual or religious belief with families where the children were raised in a more unstructured, open mm-hmm. way of connecting with God or whatever is large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what they found were, there was a longitudinal study. The children who were raised in the more non-structured spiritual or religious beliefs, when they followed these children through school, these children were actually kinder, more empathic, Mm -hmm. less judgmental, were better able to cope with conflict and challenges Mm -hmm. in school. It made me think of what you just said, where that, um, that same way the rigidity and the judgmental aspect and that inner critic kind of just steps into the mind and takes over and that's what they experience in other aspects of their life. Absolutely, because if there's an absolute truth, then there's an absolute wrong. And I think that creates anxiety disorders and depression because then I can look at my own behaviors and see where I'm screwing up, quote unquote, you know, or I can look at my peers and automatically dismiss them or discount them because they're not doing it the way that my belief system, my schema has taught me is supposed to be the way. And basically in every form, it keeps the individual from looking within. Absolutely. And it keeps them isolated from the others as well. So they're stuck between their own mind and their own spirit, as I would look at it, and they're stuck between their spirit and that of their peers next to them. And so if the religious or spiritual beliefs that they are are the ones that are the absolute truths and where they find value, that isolation also makes them very dependent, I would think, on this religious or spiritual system. Absolutely. And when you're in it, no problems, as long as the psyche is able to accept it and swallow it and enjoy it, it creates a feeling of safety. But once the child or the adult later starts to feel an incongruence with it, it's terrifying. Tamara, what would you say are some of the, the myths or misperceptions about religious abuse or spiritual abuse? Number one, that it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a given. People don't 
talk about it often. It's hard, even before this interview, I was attempting to Google the most recent statistics on it. But our research is, is so conflicted regarding this particular subject because it all depends upon your definition, not only of religion or spirituality, but what facets of it are we looking at. And so it appears that what makes a spiritual worldview to be a protective, healthy support may not be the exact same facets that cause it to be hurtful or abusive later on. So our researchers, you know, as with many things in psychology, we need further studies to to find some of the reliability and validity for the operational definitions and how they're interacting. But it is absolutely happening. And it's not just related to the sexual abuse, rather. Most people, when they think of the church as being naughty, they think of the Catholic priest molesting the altar boy. And this is a very, very different thing. It's also not just the Warren Jeffs of the world attempting to use their position of power to have child rape and marriages. It's a lot more complicated than that. And I think that's an important consideration that you point out because I think maybe there might be a misperception that if it's not sexual abuse being hidden by a church or it's not girls underage being forced to marry, that's not abusive because I think that actually the most, some of the most difficult and traumatic experiences can look completely fine on the outside. Absolutely. We see this off even in parenting where passive aggressive comments or ways of, you know, attempting on the outset on paper, it looks so pretty. Well, I'm helping my child do the best that they can. You know, the concept of like the tiger moms, the ones that are going to work them all day, every day, and who are going to have, you know, really strict rules and organizational systems. It's hard to question that because if it's phrased properly, it looks very positive on the outside. Yeah. But from the child's perspective, when he or she looks up into his, well, I almost get teary-eyed, into their caregiver's eyes and they see nothing but criticism, it's hurtful. It's abuse. Yeah. And even, um, you know, when I think about some of the clients I know who have experienced this, a lot of times it's a realization when they are you know, a lot older. I've had clients in their 50s who yeah. are just now having this realization of, oh, what happened to me with my church was really traumatic had a really negative impact on me and some of these things are just this judgment that they're bad and they're going to hell absolutely you (laughs) that's the number one thing we hear all the time and what i attempt to share with for example in my arena parents of teens who may be gay or lesbian is that i'm not here to judge your spiritual belief system i'm not even here to prove whether god exists or doesn't exist or whether there is a literal heaven or hell the point being that at your core or your spiritual worldview is supposed to be about love, acceptance, and forgiveness, rules aside or not. And your child who was here hurting will have a much higher likelihood of holding on to some, if not all, of your worldview if you back off on this aspect, this component. I love what you just described about they might be able to hold on to some or all of that worldview. Mm-hmm. I think another consequence or another, I guess, effect that I see with clients is they now have completely turned away from that worldview, possibly from any type of spiritual or religious belief altogether, because they have been so traumatized by that experience. And then I also see others who are grieving because they no longer have a connection with Mm -hmm. spirit or God or the universe. And there's a a sadness and a mourning that that was taken from them. And that, my dear Lourdes, exactly what you just hit on is one of the hardest things as a clinician to bring back, to have a client who gets so deep in that dark hole where they don't feel any sense of connection to anything outside themselves you just lost the greatest sense of support and self-care possible. I've worked with pastors who've been kicked out for being gay and they become suicidal because not only were they believing a certain worldview, but they were tasked with making sure other people held that same worldview. And when I am now asked to choose between my God and my sexuality that I can't turn off, I am forever tormented. Yeah. And I think, too, that, you know, with individuals who feel like they can't find a new connection or create a different Mm -hmm. connection from what they experience, there is also an anger 
about what has happened to them. And these things just, you know, they show up in, in symptoms mm-hmm. and the relationships. And I have a client who described it as this possible support that she could have that she saw others having, you know, peers, mm-hmm. colleagues, that that wasn't a support that she had. And she saw how a spiritual belief or, or religious belief was such a big support for others, but yet it was something that was robbed from her. And do you not think, Lourdes, then that sometimes secondary and tertiary trauma can happen as a result of having that rejection or that loss of faith and then the loss of a peer system and then the loss of the ability to reach out and that, you know, so on and so forth. Absolutely. I've even, I've even had clients who we've attempted to find, you know, well, what was key to you? Very similar to a military family separating from the military. It's, there's culture shock that goes in. You very similarly lose that sense of community, the access to resources, the access to quick answers for everything. And so oftentimes we work to reintegrate them, right? The military has even hired reintegration specialists. <laughs> I'm kind of the reintegration spiritual specialist for many of these people. And what I have found incredibly frustrating at times is they will finally, you know, be brave enough to try a, I say a new church location or a new form of spirituality. And unfortunately for a select few have been victimized a second time because they didn't get along with exactly the way it was supposed to be done in this new church. And I've seen pastors or deacons or even well-meaning committee members follow these clients in an effort, I know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, incredibly well-intended to make sure that they are, quote, okay, but for months. And that is a violation of boundaries. And once again, respecting autonomy and is thus abusive. Tamara, if there is someone listening who may be experiencing this and is not really sure where to begin and how to move forward, what would your uh, words of wisdom be for that listener? I would get real quiet and comfortable with myself in the space, whether that's in a bubble bath or meditation, you know, a place where you feel warm and secure first, because if there's anything I know, when you have been abused, there's a sense of trauma in the world being unsafe. So when you are in a a really good space, whether it's with a journal or even just in your mind, I would be thinking back to what I just mentioned. What are the themes that were important to you? What is it that the spiritual framework provides for you? And which parts of that might you want to continue moving forward? For example, I no longer practice the same form of Christianity that my parents do. However, there are certain things that I do really still kind of hold sacred or hold meaning for me. Those get to stay. And once I have pared down what those are, then I can start looking outwards again to see what other avenues might provide me those same similar feelings and themes. And there are also books and things and therapists like me out there to help you walk through the process. <laughs> <laughs> and so what would be some resources that you would recommend to those who are wanting to look more into this area? One of my favorite books is called Leaving the Fold, and it's by Dr. Marlene, I think it's Winnell, but certainly if you Google Leaving the Fold, it'll pop up on Amazon or wherever you choose to purchase it. It's an incredibly in-depth book, but it's also very insightful, both for clinicians and for anyone experiencing or thinks they may have experienced spiritual abuse. That's probably my biggest one. If you Google it, a ton of things will pop up. However, you're going to get a lot of still very religiously oriented literature. So I would tend to stay away from those and read the books that are written by people who have left. Tamara, what is the best way for listeners to get in touch with you and to find out more about what you are doing and if you have any events or other things going on that might be a support to them? Yeah, absolutely. I am on the web at ariatherapy.com. I certainly can be reached via email there at Tamara at ariatherapy.com. We have a pretty big Facebook page And then I have a new, you mentioned it in my bio, spinoff that is a lot more raw, personal, authentic. It's a little (laughs) more personal, and thus I guess you're getting the authentic side of Tams as opposed to just the counselor. And that's on my Tales from a Trapezoid page. That's been up for about two weeks and has been a really cool avenue to bring, I suppose, my counselor side into the Tamra as opposed to the Tamra into the counselor as we have on Aria. Oh, that sounds so intriguing. I'm going to need to check that out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this will certainly be one of the topics that we explore on there. 
Tamara, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for sharing your time and your you. insights and wisdom. Thank you, Lourdes. I know that so many listeners will be able to resonate with this. And hopefully for those who are experiencing this, begin to feel like their support and there are ways for them to begin to move through this. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tamara. Thank you. Wow, what an incredible conversation. I really liked how Tamara described how she brings spirituality into the therapy experience and starts that conversation with her clients by asking what their spiritual affiliation or worldview is and if they have one, how is it meaningful to them? I also was inspired by her approach to really being curious about how her clients experience religion or spirituality and then creating the therapeutic experience to support and respect that. It also stood out to me, just in our attempts and our conversation to really define what religion and spirituality are, just how personal and unique a person's relationship to something greater is, and that that something greater can be so many different things. And last but not least, how deeply wounding spiritual abuse can be in that it damages and possibly destroys a profound source of support wisdom, and strength for the individual. For show notes to today's episode, and for links to the resources Tamara mentioned, including her website, visit www.lordisviado.com and click on podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with a friend and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. Thanks so much for listening and see you next time.